All right. Thank you for the amazing talks, Jason and Samit. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief because I know that we're already uh, running very late, but Samit covered a ton of details around Anomalib and the particular visual anomaly detection challenge at CVPR. Uh, at a high level, we know that anomaly detection and defect detection are essential for robotics. Uh, if you are going to have robotic embodied agents and, and entities out there in the real world, uh, there are going to be things that were not or, or could not be put in the training set. So the ability to have a flexible system, uh, something that is able to take in uh, new scenarios that you haven't seen before and be able to identify them and uh, make custom actions or determine that there is a need for human intervention or, or human uh, assistance there uh, is essential. So what I'm going to be doing is showing you uh, a part of the data lifecycle surrounding uh, the unsupervised training of these anomaly detection models that Summit was talking about with Anomalib. Uh, so I'm gonna share a couple of things with you real quick. Uh, everything that I'll be talking about today, more or less, except for like the specifics of the, like, the visuals I'll be showing you, but like the, the workflow to actually generate this code for yourself is all in this notebook, which Jimmy will be sharing the link to, as well as all the other resources I'll be showing. But uh, Summit mentioned uh, lots of things about all the different models that you can use with Anomalib, uh, like patch core and efficient AD and PADIM and everything else. Uh, and all of the cool things that you can do, like uh, basically exporting it into a format uh, that is uh, able to be you know, efficiently run on specific hardware. So we can see everything from how we create a custom folder to uh, you know, putting this all in 51 and visualizing it and evaluating it to doing things like, as I, where's the export? There should be an export somewhere around here. Yeah, so uh, this handles like all of the, the exporting of, of the data and of the model into OpenVINO format for you and the inference and all that stuff around it to basically streamline your experience testing out these all these models uh, and seeing the interaction between your models and your data uh, in real time. So I'm not going to be focusing on this code in particular. What I'm going to be focusing on, uh, you can see the open Vino inference are here, but what I'm going to be focusing on uh, is once we have this data, uh, either in the beginning before we're actually training our models, what can we learn from it? How can we use that to inform the types of models we might want to uh, be training. Uh, and once we have our models trained, how can we better evaluate them beyond just F1 score or uh, like er uh, accuracy and precision and whatever else? Like how can we dig in deeper? So the, the data set that I'm going to be showing you is the MV Tech AD data set that uh, Samit was mentioning. Uh, in addition to its source at the MV Tech website, you can also get it from Hugging Face. So at the Voxel 51 organization, uh, you can see this MV Tech AD data set here with all of this stuff in it, and you can load it via these simple instructions. You can also play around with it on try.51.ai for free. So you don't need to even install or download all this data to actually play around with all of this stuff and to filter and do whatever other fun stuff you might want to do with this data set. Uh, but what I'm going to be showing you is with a local version of the data set. So um, I basically just created the 51 session. I already have computed everything on this data set. I have some predictions. Uh, I've done a uh, generation of embeddings uh, with one a semantic model, a CLIP, OpenAI's contrastive language image pre-training model, and created indexes over the data with that, uh, as well as a more pixels and patches model called ResNet50. Uh, and I've used those to kind of give us some insight when when you combine those with dimensionality reduction techniques, you can get a better sense for what's going on inside your data. So, you know, we can filter through the data, we can look at it by category, I can look at, let's say I only want to see the hazelnuts or I only want to see the screws. Uh, I can look at just things that have specific types of defects. So I only want to see threads that have thread side up. Cool. I can see all these different ways of engaging with the data. Uh, I can even see, I just want to see the, the test split, for instance. Uh, I'm going to reset all of these uh, and go back. But if you want to do more than that, as I said, I meant I uh, computed some embeddings on this data. So we can do things like take an image and do a similarity search. So here I'll use ResNet and we'll find all of the images that are most similar to that. 
And so these are the images that ResNet thinks are most similar to that. Now, this case is not particularly interesting, but we could find a more interesting case if I go down and let's say I look at something like a screw. Now, let me choose this screw because there's screws in all different types of orientations. Let me choose, for instance, I'll use clip and I'll find the most similar things and we can see the most similar ones are the ones that had the same or close to that same orientation. We can also do things like, uh, let me exit out of this. Uh, we can semantically search with this clip uh, index that we've generated. So I can search for zippers and find the things that look most like zippers in the data set. And these are the these are what we get. So some of them are actually zippers, some of them are grids. Uh, and of course, this is uh, not a perfect science, uh, but it gives us a way of interacting with the data. Uh, but we can also, instead of just doing these individual similarity searches, use dimensionality reduction to look at the overall structure of the data. So the, the global and local structure of all of our uh, data together. So we're going to do that if I reset this. Um, we can go to this embeddings tab over here and we can choose some embeddings. Okay, so we're gonna choose this clip visualization, which took the clip embeddings and ran UMAP, uh, which is a uh, dimension reality reduction technique, uh, which uses topology. Uh, and this is putting it down to two dimensions. So each point here corresponds to an image over here. We can see there's clustering. We can look at what the clusters are. These all are bottles. What are these? These are all transistors. What are these? Okay, hazelnuts. So now that we have a good sense for what these are, we can actually color by a property that might be interesting. Let's color by the category label. And we can see it does pretty much actually cluster like that. But there's a couple of clusters that are spread out a little bit. So why is this cluster and this cluster so small and disparate? In this case, it it appears that it's the color of the bristles. So there's one little cluster for one color of bristles, then there's another color, and then there's a third color over here. We can try coloring by defects as well. So if I want to color by defect, I can see for some of these, it's actually helpful. For some of them, it may not be helpful. So we go in here and we look at this, the bottles. Uh, we can see there is some pretty good clustering by defect type, uh, but for some of them, they're it's basically not that helpful at all. It's everything's kind of all over the place. And this is why we're not using this ResNet model itself or a clip model itself. We're doing an unsupervised learning approach for this. Uh, we're, we're going to try to meet the data where it is. Uh, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk very briefly and I'll, I'll be done very soon uh, about once we already have these predictions on our data set. So here we have some uh, anomaly predictions and defect masks and segmentations on our data. Uh, in this case, it's for bottles. And so I'm going to just look at the, the test bottles. And I'm going to save this. I'm going to create a stage, a, a data set view out of this. Uh, and now we should see just 83 samples. So this is all the bottles in our test split. And once they appear, we should be able to see all of the masks. So we can see things like this is our predicted mask. We can get a sense for where it's going wrong, where it's actually pretty good. This is the, the real mask or the ground truth mask. Uh, we can do things like look at where the segmentation had a high precision and a high recall. And when we do that, we can see a lot of them, if I go even, let me go even further. So most of these have the, the defect in the middle. But if we instead look at things which have you know, high precision, but maybe a low recall, we can see a different story. So let me actually move this a little bit. Uh, and you can see the value in having these interactive and dynamic and playing with them. Uh, and when we do this, uh, we can try to get a sense for, okay, what is going on here? Why is the, this model predicting one thing, but the ground truth is, is another thing? Uh, I can even look at the heat maps associated with this. So predicted map. 
So this is like where the model is most strongly certain that it is a defect versus it's not a defect. Uh, I can look at the, let me turn all these off and just see the, the, the ground truth and see the actual data. For this one, the, our model thinks that maybe one, like maybe this is the defect in its prediction, but really this is the defect in the ground truth. And maybe that's an edge case. So these are just things for us to keep in mind as we are investigating and trying to choose the right model for our particular use case. Uh, that's all that I have for you today. Uh, if you are interested in this uh, and in the visual anomaly detection challenge, uh, Jimmy is putting all the links in the, uh, the chat, uh, but uh, just 51 can be useful to you. Uh, Anomalib uh, can be useful to you. Uh, together, even more powerful. Uh, so I hope that this just gives you a sense for what is possible if you combine uh, unsupervised learning with these types of data curation, visualization, and analysis techniques. Uh, that's it. Thank you, guys. All right. So you do have a question that got cross posted in the chat. So I'll just go ahead and feed it to you. Jacob, how big are your embeddings? Are you using any particular vector DB to store the embeddings and index? Great question. Uh, so in this case, uh, I'm just using clip. So they're 512. There are other clip models, which are 768. These are 512 dimensional and ResNet, which are, I believe, 2048. Uh, but you can use much larger embeddings. You can use a data set which has uh, millions or billions of samples. And we have native integrations with six and counting vector databases uh, if you want to do this all efficiently.